So if you have uh, if you have Bibles, let's go ahead and open open them up to the book of Romans, Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter one. So a couple of weeks ago, we finished our long run through the Gospel of Matthew. And last week, and I know there's a lot of you who couldn't make it last week, and we get that because of all of the snow and ice and stuff. Uh, that uh, we actually started Romans last week and we looked at a kind of a broad overview of the entire letter. We're going to start in the text itself in a large way today. Uh, but for those of you who weren't here and those of you who were, just as a way of reminder, the basic themes of Romans are sin and salvation and sanctification, the daily setting apart of the people of God for the purposes of God. We talked about the sovereignty of God, the rule of God over all things and over particularly our lives and our salvation. Uh, and we talked about service to God and how what God has done in saving us from our sin and setting us apart for his sovereign service is that we serve God in many, many ways and in the ways that he has laid out and set apart for us. And then it concludes with a, a greeting, kind of a, a real world salutation. So sin, salvation, sanctification, sovereignty, service and salutation were the six sort of main uh, kind of kind of essential words or ideas that are, we're going to run into them a lot as we go through Romans. So we're going to be in Romans chapter 1, and uh, if you're following along in your sermon notes, which are in your bulletin, there are some fill in the blanks for you there. But our big idea, kind of big controlling idea for us today is this, before we begin reading through the body of the letter to the Romans, Paul's introductory remarks tell us the essentials that we need to know about Paul, so who he is, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then Jesus himself. So he has several things that he's going to talk about. Now, every uh, one of the, the letters of the New Testament, so there, there are different kinds of literature in the New Testament. There's like what we found in the Gospel of Matthew, which is a narrative, an, an unfolding of a, a, a story, a true historical narrative of like Jesus in the Gospels or the Apostles and the Church in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. And then there are letters, which are personal letters written from apostles to different churches. And this is one of those. Now, every letter would begin with kind of a greeting. You know how if you, I don't know how many of you actually still write letters. Some of you email. Some of you don't even do that anymore. Some of you just instant message or text or whatever. But, you know, with a letter, there was always that sort of normal opening that you would go, Dear Frank, or whoever it was you were reading to. And you would begin by identifying the recipient of the letter. Well, an ancient letter, like we have here in Romans and Galatians and Ephesians and all of the New Testament letters, begins differently than the way we would begin a letter if we were to write one today. They actually identify themselves first. So instead of dear Frank, it's, hey, this is fill in the blank. This is Sam. This is Paul. This is John. This is Mark. This is whoever is writing the letter. So this is how it's going to begin. He, he tells us the basics about himself, or some basics, tells us about the gospel, and tells us about Jesus. Now, when, when we've kind of run into one of these letters, normally it's really easy to kind of go, all the letters sort of begin the same way. And we kind of rush through them, right? And we sort of, I think, miss out on certain important things. So what we're going to do is we're going to do the opposite. We're going to go a little slow. And we're going to take two weeks, this week and next week, to cover the introduction or Paul's introductory remarks to Romans. So we're going to talk about three things, Paul, the gospel, and Jesus this week, and then three other things that he talks about in the introduction next week. So that's where we are. So, here's your first fill in the blank. Before we begin reading Romans, or at least the body of the letter, past the introduction, Paul tells us what we need to know about himself. Paul tells us what we need to know about himself. So, himself is your fill in there. We're going to begin by reading just Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 1. And he begins this way. Paul, so he identifies himself, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. All right, so we'll stop right there. 
Paul. So he identifies himself. This is who is writing the letter. Now, if you were with us a couple of years ago when we went through the book of Acts, that's where we really meet Paul in kind of his full biographical glory, right? Now, he is, by the writing of Romans, he is probably the most forward defender of Christianity, right? He is the one who is making these grand missionary journeys, all of these travels. He's going to all kinds of different places that have not heard about Jesus, and he is going forward and he is bringing the gospel of Christ to people who don't know about him. Right? That's who Paul is. This is his job. But that's not who he was when we first meet him. When we first meet him, he is a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus. And when we first meet Saul of Tarsus, he is the opposite of what he is when he is writing this letter to the Romans. He is the most staunch adversary of Christianity that there possibly was. When we meet him, he is basically doing the precise opposite of what he's doing in Romans. He is making grand journeys, not to win people to Christ, but to arrest Christians. And even if he can manage it, put some of them to death. Or see to it that they are put on trial and put to death by authorities. This is who he was. He was a, a zealous Pharisee. Right? And we meet the Pharisees in the Gospels. Most of the Pharisees we meet are what you might label as villains, right? They are the people who stand opposed to Christ. They stand opposed to his disciples. They're trying to constantly get Jesus to flake out or fail or do any of those things. This is who Saul of Tarsus, or as we know him, Paul, this is who he is as a human being. But then something happened, didn't it? As we read through the book of the Acts of the Apostles, he has just gotten permission from some of the authorities in Jerusalem. He's on his way to Damascus. He's ready to just go to town on any Christian he finds to put a stop to the spread of Christianity when God puts a stop to him doing that. Right? He knocks him down, blinds him, and reveals that the God that Saul thinks he's worshiping is actually Jesus whom he is persecuting. Which is actually something that, that Jesus says when Paul says, or Saul says, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Which is interesting because that's Jesus identifying himself so closely with his followers that any persecution of them is persecution of himself. Right? He says, I am Jesus whom you are troubling. You are persecuting me. Stop doing that. And then he, a a after Saul kind of comes to his senses and goes, oh no, <laughs> what, what have I been doing? All sorts of stuff happens and eventually he becomes this ardent defender, apologist, evangelist of Christianity. And so we sometimes look at people and we say, oh man, there's no hope for that guy. Nobody was as mean, nobody was as cruel to Christianity as Saul of Tarsus was. And now he is its most ardent defender. So we always sometimes, I think, have to caution ourselves on losing hope in certain people and saying, man, that person, there's no way. The reality is this. Saul didn't like go to church and go to a Sunday school class and decide to give Jesus his heart, right? This is what salvation is. And this is some of our first hints about what he's going to talk about later around chapters 9, 10, and 11. Salvation is an absolute miracle working of God. Salvation is when God changes somebody's heart toward himself. Somebody who is not pointed towards God. Somebody who is against God in many ways, whether they knew it or not. Right? In Saul's case, he knew it. He was against Jesus, but now he's very for Jesus. When a person is redeemed, when a person is saved, it's because God did a miracle in their heart. You see this actually in the Old Testament Right? The picture of, uh, in the book of Ezekiel, for example, the valley of the dry bones. 
right? His, his people are all dried, dead bones. They don't decide for themselves. They don't kind of go, we want to be alive again. God simply makes them alive. This is what God does. Because the New Testament tells us, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. But dead men don't choose life. God makes us alive. God makes us alive. And this is who Paul is. Somebody who has once an ardent anti-Christian, now its most ardent defender when he's writing Romans. Right? This is who we're meeting. So this is who he is. We have to have all of this in understanding who Paul is. So he says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. He identifies himself not first with his grand title, Apostle. That's not how he identifies himself at first. That he says, but not yet. The first word he uses to identify or, or characterize himself is the word servant. Now, we see the word servant in English and we think somebody who, you know, maybe that's like an employee. The word in the Greek language means bond servant or better, slave. Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ. I... I he is my master. He, uh, it's not, this is not just like, yeah, I think I'll work for that guy because he pays me well or, you know, there's good benefits or I am bound to him and wherever he sends me, I go. I, I, I will do his will, his will first. He identifies himself not with a grand title, but a lowly one. And he is defined here chiefly by his relationship with Jesus Christ. Whenever anybody, you know, you meet somebody for the first time, right? We, we always want to know something about them. Well, tell me about yourself. Like, about what do we always say? Hi, I'm Sam. You're Steve or Frank or whatever. What do you do? What, 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 is, what, what sort of defines you? That's sort of where our mind first goes. Well, what's your occupation? What's your station in life? Well, what do you do? I want to know you, so tell me what you do. And, and Paul kind of does that, but that even is subservient to this personal relation he has. Outside of simply, yeah, I'm a slave, but I'm a slave to... Jesus Christ. This is how he identifies himself. He identifies himself chiefly in relation to Christ. Jesus is my master. Who, who are you? I'm Paul, and he's the one you need to know about. He diverts the attention sort of off of himself and says, you want to know about me? You got you to learn Jesus. Because that's why I live. That's why I do what I do. So Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. Number one, his apostolic office, or the fact that he's an apostle, is not an achievement. Right? He didn't earn apostleship. It is a calling. It's something that that happened on the road to Damascus. It's not, you know, Paul's wonder, going around and saying, I wonder how I can be in this Christianity thing and sort of reach the top. Right? That's not what he does. He's very anti-Christian, and suddenly God says, you're going to be one of my chief leaders of my movement that I've started called Christianity. That's a continuance of what I have been doing since Old Testament times. But I, I, I want you... And this is not something Saul would have chosen for himself. How many times do we find ourselves serving God in ways that we never thought we would have? Right? And this is a story I probably have told this here, but if I have, bear with me. I can remember going to church as a, probably an 8, 9, 10-year-old kid and watching my pastor, Steve Hartman, stand up and give a sermon, and I can very clearly and distinctly, and I don't remember why this is my memory, but it is, me sitting in one of the chairs, looking at Steve, give one of his sermons, and thinking, yeah, there's no way I could ever do that. I, I wouldn't have chosen this for myself, but I think this is what God chose for me. And I'm not like, oh, I don't like doing this. That's not, don't hear me on that. I love this the best, okay? Too bad you can't do it. Mm, that's how I feel about it, right? Because what would I ever do 
other than what God has called me to do that would be better for me? Nothing. N nothing. Not a, not a thing. I, I was, I was getting ready for a mission trip in 2001. Uh, there was a group of us from our school going to Australia, and we were going around to different churches. And somebody was there asking, I think he was like an old retired pastor, and he was asking all of us people on the trip, well, what are you in school for? What are you training for? And, you know, people were musicians, and people were this, that, and you know, education or whatever. And he came to me, and I said, well, I'm training to be a pastor. And he said, well, why are you doing that? And I said, honestly, at this point, I can't do anything else. And he said, that's right. When God calls you to be a pastor, there's nothing you can do. When God calls you to do anything and to be anything, there's nothing you can do. There isn't anything you can do. And I meant that in terms of, I really don't have a whole lot of other skills that make sense for a career or whatever that are, you know, could support me or in a family, no less, right? But the reality is, is that there's this thing standing behind it that if God calls you, as he called Saul to be Paul and an apostle, there's nothing that Saul could have. You think that on the road to Damascus, he could have said, thanks but no thanks? Do you think that would have gone over? Do you think God would have said, oh, well, sorry, my mistake, I'll find somebody else? No, because he doesn't make mistakes. Two, no, because that was his idea and that's how it was going to go. When God calls you, there's nothing you can do. And that's actually a good thing. That's a very good thing. So Saul, Paul, called to be an apostle. We too are called to different kinds of ministry. Uh, second, apostolic ministry was a temporary office in the first century. Okay, we don't have apostles today. Why? Well, what's the point of an apostle? Why, why did God have apostles? Well, what, what was the thing that they were there for? Well, part of it was obviously going out and doing the evangelistic ministry that we see people like, you know, um, Paul doing and, and sometimes Peter and, and some of the others. But other people can do evangelistic ministry. Other people can do missionary ministry. So what were they doing? Well, what do we have? How do, how do we have a New Testament? God gave it through the apostles. God gave the New Testament through the apostles. That's how he chose to reveal the New Testament word of God. He had these apostles, and you could only be an apostle, except for in one special case, and that happens to be in Paul's case, if, for example, you were one of the people who was with Jesus during his earthly ministry. That was one of the ways they identified apostles. And that was kind of the chief way. Now, Paul, of course, comes along after the resurrection of Christ. He's confronted on the road to Damascus after the resurrection and ascension. But, and he's given sort of a special kind of grounds to be an, an apostle and do his traveling ministry and evangelism and all of that. But these are the people through whom God chose to reveal the written word of God. The, the apostles were first century unique sorts of people. We don't, we don't continue apostles on because we don't need to because we have this. We have the written word of God. We have the witness to what the apostles were given by God to give to the church. And then we have people who, you know, God raised up. So if you go and read Ephesians chapter 4, God gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. Certain of those were temporary. Certain of those are continuing. Pastor is one of the continuing ones. Evangelist is one of the continuing ones, right? Things that continue on so that what is written may be expounded to the church and that we might all be reminded what our marching orders are. So Paul was one of these unique guys. He's one of these guys who was temporarily set apart for a very specific, very amazing work in the first century. And, and with the close of the first century and the death of the last apostles, probably John, we don't have any more apostles. We don't have any more of them. They don't continue. 
right? This is one of the things that you will find in cults is that some of them that are trying to fake Christianity will say, well, we've got this apostle. No, you don't. Because we have all we need. And typically what you'll find from those apostles is something that contradicts this. We don't need that. We need this. Stick with this. So this is why Paul is writing to the Romans. He's writing to convey to them a revelation of the word of God. That's why we have it in our Bible. That's why we have it in our Bible. So Paul, servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. While all Christians are called to obey, for example, the Great Commission. We talked about the Great Commission with the close of our Matthew series, because that's how Jesus closes and how Matthew closes his book. Jesus giving what's called the Great Commission. Go, therefore. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And look, I'm with you always until the end of the age. That's the Great Commission, Jesus sort of marching orders for the church. Now, all of us as followers of Christ, all of us as true members of the church are called to obey that. But Paul is given sort of a special focus on that very task. Paul is called to a special concentration of it, journeying around the world, heralding the gospel. And we're going to find as we go through the book of Romans, that's part of also his intent with writing the book. He's looking to expand his base through which he can continue doing the work of the ministry, going out, sharing the gospel. One of the things he'll say to the Romans is, I, I, want, to, I want to come and share the gospel there in Rome because it's this huge cosmopolitan place, a million people, about a million people are in Rome. But it's a place that all of these other cultures come, and it's a place from which all of these ideas and, and ministry and all sorts of stuff can finally go forward in a big way into the world. And that's part of Paul's desire in writing his letter to the Romans. He wants in on that. He wants to be a part of what God is doing, and God is calling him to do certain things through the church in Rome. So that's your point number one. Point number two. Next, Paul tells us what we need to know about the ancient nature of the gospel. Paul tells us what we need to know about the ancient nature of the gospel. The ancient nature of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 1, verse 2. So uh, let me back up and just read from verse 1 because it's a continuous thought. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, verse 2, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Which he promised beforehand. So we'll start with promised beforehand. The gospel is the fulfillment of a long-standing promise of God. Some people will look at the New Testament and look at the ministry of Christ and the ministry of the apostles and make this false assumption. Well, the other stuff was great, but now he's doing something completely different, or maybe it's a plan B or something. That's not it. Okay? The church is not plan B. It's a continuation of what he's been doing since the Old Testament, since the very beginning, when Adam and Eve first took the fruit in the Garden of Eden, like they, as they were disobeying the command of God, when God steps in and he says, you know, this is wrong, you shouldn't have done this, now there are all of these consequences. One of the consequences that's listed is that there's going to be this animosity, he says, between the woman and her seed, her, the, the family that comes after that, so all of humanity, and the serpent, and the serpent's seed. And it says, the, the serpent will strike the heel of the family line of the humanity, and the, the heel will come down and crush the head of the serpent. And that's actually the first hint that we have at the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
because the serpent is this figure, this person, this thing that is slithered into the perfect world of God and introduced lies and falsehood and tricked and sort of urged humanity to rebel against God. And so the crushing of the head of the serpent is the defeat of the problem that was caused by that serpent. And the one who defeats that problem is the savior. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 is sometimes called the Proto-Evangelium, or the first account of the gospel. And it's all the way there back in Genesis. Jesus has been there throughout the entire process, preparing and making possible his coming into the world to be the Savior so that our sin might be washed away by the blood of his cross and we might receive new life by his resurrection from the dead. That's always been the plan. And so what Paul is talking about here in Romans chapter one, verse two, is promised beforehand. Look, it's always been here. And in Galatians, he says, the gospel was preached beforehand to Abraham. So it's not like he did it just once and then dropped that hint and then shut up about it. It's continuous. And as we read through the other Gospels, as you read through the Gospel of Luke, for example, after the resurrection, when Jesus is walking on the road to Emmaus with two of the disciples who aren't quite recognizing him, he's saying, look, you guys are foolish and slow of heart because you don't believe everything that God said about these things in the Scriptures. And then it says he began to open to them all the things in the scriptures that are said about himself, which apparently is a lot of things. Read Psalm 22, read all kinds of things, read the book of Isaiah, it's all over the place. There, the gospel is woven throughout the entirety of the Old Testament and the New. It's promised beforehand. God is therefore faithful and trustworthy. So promised beforehand through the prophets, the prophets who were the spokesmen for God, delivering messages to his people and sometimes to other nations, like Jonah going to Nineveh and saying, repent. Now, we, we sometimes hear the word prophet and we think future seers. There's the people who talk about some distant future. No, actually, usually they were talking about the present for the people who were hearing their messages. Right? Most of the time it's, this is happening now, this is what you're doing now, and you need to stop doing that now, and you need to repent now and turn back to God now. That's dominantly what the prophets were for. But there are also sometimes future seers. And part of that was woven throughout their messages were both present things and these things about there's going to be a savior. There's going to be one who comes. Uh, so, you know, in some ways, the Old Testament apostles, apostles, I don't know what that is, apostles are equivalent to the New Testament apostles, so prophets and apostles. Old Testament prophets, New Testament apostles, roughly similar. So Paul will say in Ephesians, based on the foundation of the prophets and the apostles, the Old Testament and the New this is who we are. We've, we spring from this. So promised beforehand through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Now, when Paul is writing Romans, how much of the Bible is there? Mostly the Old Testament. So this is what he's talking about. When, it talk, when the New Testament talks about the Scriptures, it's first and foremost talking about the Old Testament. Right? Sometimes we look at the Old Testament and we go, whew, that's a little intimidating. I can't pronounce those names. Who's Mahershal El Hashbaz? Right? That's my favorite Old Testament name. Right? I don't know where Grace is, but when she and Brian are ready to have their first kid and if it's a son, I recommend Mahershal El Hashbaz. Right? That's, that's, my, that's going to put my two cents in on that one. But they did not have to wait for the New Testament to be written to preach the gospel because it was woven throughout the Old Testament. When you look at the, the, the sermon of Peter on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, and he's preaching the gospel, what does he reference? Joel, the prophet Joel in the Old Testament. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. 
he references the Old Testament because there wasn't a New Testament at that point, but he's preaching the gospel. He's preaching the gospel because it's woven throughout the Old. It's woven throughout the Old. Number three, third, Paul tells us what we need to know about Jesus in relation to the gospel. Paul tells us what we need to know about Jesus in relation to the gospel. Romans chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. Concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. So, Jesus concerning his son, the son of God, second member of the Trinity, right? Descended from David. We see here the two natures of Jesus Christ. He's the Son of God, He's divine, and He's also physically descended from David. He's human. This is one of the great mysteries of the Christian faith. One of the great mysteries is what we call the incarnation, or the, the two natures of Jesus. He's truly God, and He's truly man. He was God from eternity past, and when he stepped into history, he added to himself a second nature, the human nature. So this is part of what we see. We're talking about the incarnation here. He's both the divine son, and uh, so, which means he's co-equal, co-eternal with God the Father and the Holy Spirit, as well as incarnate in human flesh that's descended according to the royal line of King David. Right? So he's establishing certain facts about who Jesus is. And he's saying this is important for you to understand. To understand the gospel, to understand the truth that God has revealed to us in the scriptures, you need to know these things about Jesus. He is, a, he is in a royal line, a human royal line, as well as in he's sovereign because he's God. So we're talking lots of authority here in view. Then it says he was declared to be the Son of God in power. So this is more than an empty claim, obviously. But how do we know it's been more than an empty claim to just say? Because all, all sorts of people make claims about their, you know, their belief system or whatever. But, you know, one of them can be true and the others can't. That's sort of how truth works. So how do you know? that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. What does Paul mean by declared to be the Son of God in power? He means that it has been verifiably demonstrated by the power of God in a variety of ways. So, for example, the performance of miracles that Jesus did. He was, he was in time historically doing miracles. People witnessed these miracles. They testified to these miracles. So that's one of the ways in which we know. But that's only a small part of the verification. Because Paul actually has something bigger in mind for a historical verification of who Jesus is. So, but let's continue on with what he says. So, declare to be the Son of God in power, according to the Spirit of holiness. The Holy Spirit was the member of the Trinity most directly involved in the demonstration that Paul is talking about. The Holy Spirit of God. So, this is one of the, by the way, side note on the opening to Paul's letter to the Romans. This is one of the things that we don't see in every opening. When we read through a lot of the openings of Paul's other letters, or some of the other letters by the other apostles, we'll find mentions of Jesus and we'll find mentions of the Father. This is one of the rare cases where the entire Trinity shows up in the opening to one of these letters. The idea that Paul is trying to get across here is that what we know about Jesus and the Gospel, it's important to understand in a Trinitarian context. The whole Trinity is involved in the gospel. Amen. This is not just, hey, Jesus saves. Yes, Jesus saves, but Jesus saves, the Father saves, and the Holy Spirit saves as well. They're all involved. They're all in agreement on this, and Paul is highlighting this for us. So according to the spirit of holiness, so, whatever it is that he's talking about here, the specific demonstration 
that proves Christ's Messiahship, it, the Holy Spirit's involved with it. The Holy Spirit's involved with it. So let's move on to the next one, because here's the demonstration. This is the thing he has in mind by his resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the historically verifiable demonstration that Jesus Christ is the Son of God in power. The Holy Spirit raises him from the dead. This, by the way, is what the Holy Spirit does to us. In Romans chapter 8, verse 11, we'll get there who knows how long from now. Okay? He says the Holy Spirit quickens us or makes us alive. That's resurrection talk. That's resurrection talk. Well, here he's involved in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the demonstration of sonship. The Holy Spirit raising Jesus from death is the powerful event that declares his sonship in relationship to God the Father. There's no Christianity without the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's none. If you were to subtract that, you don't have Christianity. You would have a guy who's sort of an interesting, quirky teacher, right? Because all of his claims are verified by this. Now, here's the other thing that we can say about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is probably the best attested event in ancient history. We think When we think about all of the other events, like big events, like the destruction of Mount Vesuvius, the blowing of that, right? Or, um, you know, did William Shakespeare exist? Did Plato exist? We have far, and I mean far less evidence for any of that stuff than we have for the resurrection of Christ. Uh, on the manuscript level alone, it, it's an embarrassing amount of evidence that we have that points to the veracity of the New Testament. It's, it's crazy how much manuscript evidence we have alone. But we also have evidence from outside of the Bible that points to the fact that Christianity was a growing, thriving thing. We have people like Suetonius, Roman writers, talking about people that are following this Christ person and it growing and spreading and talking about the resurrection. There, there are non-believing New Testament scholars today who will say, yeah, we can't explain the resurrection apart from it actually being the resurrection, which you know, baffles me that they're non-believing because if you can't explain it, doofus, maybe you should believe it. Let's think about that for a second. But this is the reality. Jesus Christ is Lord. And that's how he ends this. Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's the last line of verse 4. The Lordship of Jesus Christ means a variety of things. He is our Savior in brokenness. Our Savior from our sin. He is our King in life. He is our commanding officer in our service. He is our authorizer to be about His business in the world. And He is our model for the character in which we will obey Him in all things. Jesus Christ is our Lord. He's in charge. He's King. He is above all things. And we look to him and we say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. So may we be people who, along with Paul, see how we are all called to serve God. Who, along with Paul, look to Jesus Christ and say, yes, Lord. Who, along with Paul, look to Jesus Christ and say, you are the Son of God declared to be the Son of God in power, verifiably demonstrated in history. We trust you. We trust you. You are our Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the grace that you have given to us through Jesus Christ. We thank you for the great symphonic writing that is Paul's letter to the Romans that we will be, we've only begun to 
finally scratch the surface of. And then in the coming weeks and throughout the rest of this year and a little bit into the following year as we go through this letter, we pray, Father, that our hearts would be guided by your spirit to trust in you more deeply, to obey you more thoroughly, and to love you more completely. Help us to be like Paul in this, so dedicated to you that we define ourselves by you first before we define ourselves by our, even our jobs or our other relationships. We pray all of this in your name. Amen.